Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us for our safety webinar. We're going to get started in about 30 seconds. Just want to give people um, an opportunity to log in. So thank you, thank you, thank you for for joining us, making sure that everyone can get in. Right. If you're just joining us, we're going to get started in about 15 seconds. Just want to give people the opportunity to get in since we're only going to be on an hour. Oops. We want to make sure that, oh man, how do I go back? I want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to get in. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us for this safety webinar. We are super, super, super excited to have Elisa Gonzalez with us, uh, Director of Loss Control at the Insurance Board. Um, super, super excited that she's here to help us to create uh, safe spaces and uh, new strategies for the LGBTQ IA community. Since we only have an hour, we're going to go ahead and get started. Just some general housekeeping um, information here. Panelists are the only ones you're that you're going to be able to see during the session. So this is a webinar. Uh, so it's not like a traditional Zoom when you'll see all the screens of everyone and who's on. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Please feel free to utilize the Q&A function. There's a Q&A function in the bottom of your screen and there is a little toggle if you want to ask a question anonymously you can do that so feel free to ask those questions i'm going to be monitoring them during the session and as they come in i will uh ask uh lisa um kind of to pause and answer those questions um also the session is being recorded and it will be on our YouTube page tomorrow. And if you registered for this session, you will receive a link tomorrow um, with that YouTube um, link. So I wanted to put that out. Just a couple of things um, that we have going on this month for Pride. Next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we have a sexual wellness webinar. We're going to be talking to uh, uh, GI Dr. Carlton, he's on Facebook, on, on Instagram and TikTok. He uh, has a pretty nice following there where he gives all kinds of sexual wellness uh, tips and he's an uh, activist. We're going to be looking at monkeypox and PrEP and PEP and STD prevention, making sexual healthy sexual choices and the like. So again, it's free. Uh, participation is private and confidential. So again, you can come in, ask those questions. And then the following Thursday, June the 22nd at 7 p.m., we're looking at Beyond the Binaries. We're having an awesome panel of individuals of unique, uh, bountifully expansive human experiences is what we're talking about. And so you'll make sure that you join that. We've also started a podcast. You can search us right now on our YouTube page, on Apple Music and Spotify. It's on Google it's just not showing up in the search yet because it's brand new, but um, you can listen in and check that out. And of course, we're always thankful in asking people to remember us in your um, pride donations this month. Um, so we have the QR code there. So now that we have the church announcements out of the way, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to our presenter. And if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and, and doing all of that, we'll get sure. started. Okay. So I'm good to go, right? You can see everything? Yep. Okay, fantastic. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you for having me here. Um, I'm really happy to be here. My name is Lisa Gonzalez. I am the Director of Loss Control at Insurance Board. Um, people hear loss control sometimes and they think of, you know, shoplifting or something, but, you know, <laughs> essentially um, 
we are focused on risk management. Um, just to give you a little background about myself, um, what am I doing here? I have worked in and among um, faith communities for 30 years, um, predominantly up in and out of nonprofit organizations and faith-based organizations, working for domestic violence coalitions, um, serving on boards of directors um, for various organizations. I helped start an emergency crisis shelter for children, um, one of only two in the state of Ohio, and you know have worked directly out of and served on um, in leadership within um, churches. So um, I came to Insurance Board with a passion because I had spent a lot of time mitigating risk on the front end, and now I'm here um, to be able to support churches across the country um, because I'm very passionate about the work of all the great work that they're doing and uh, really want to see them be able to sustain. And I know that they have um, been under targeted um, attacks from a number of, of different places. And so um, based on some of the conversations that we had, um, I shared a number of resources that we're aware of that um, we would like to make all of you aware of, and um, hopefully you will find this to be, this presentation to be helpful for all of you. So without further ado, I'm going to get started because we only have an hour, but um, I would say I'd encourage you to please um, put any questions as I'm going along in the chat and um, I know that they're going to be monitored and they can stop and let me know um, and ask the question. And um, hopefully I will be able to uh, provide the answers. And if I cannot, I promise you that I will find out the answers. So um, moving forward, just to give you a little background about how, who Insurance Board is, um, we are a nonprofit um, organization serving ministries and churches across the country offering superior property and casualty risk and insurance management services. Um, the denominations listed, um, we are considered a um, financial ministry under the United Church of Christ. And we have an ecumenical partnership with the denominations that are listed on the screen. And um, But we are here to be able to share information and resources. And most of our resources can all be shared with anyone at any time. So with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and move forward. Talking a little bit about emergency planning. So the plan is the critical component of um, making sure that there's an emergency plan in place for um, encountering risks that congregations or ministries may be facing. And never 20 years ago, if you told me that I would be the big planner and making sure that there's a plan in place, I would have told you that you were crazy. But um, I have seen time and again how critical this component is because it is difficult to know what to do when you're faced with an emergency situation if you have not thought about it before and everyone isn't on the same page and everyone doesn't know what their role should be or what their responsibility should be in order to make sure that they're reacting quickly and um, doing whatever they can do to mitigate any sort of loss, um, specifically loss of life or loss of, of someone being injured or hurt um, in your congregation. And ideally, this is going toward focusing on prevention because if we plan well enough, there are a number of things that maybe we could ideally avoid. Okay, so um, we're going to just identify a few risks that I wanted to bring top of mind to ministries um, that we should just kind of consider um, first and foremost, active intruder, which um, although there are a number of risks listed here, that's going to predominantly be the one that I'm going to give more information on and focus on throughout this presentation. However, um, just wanting to mention other um, emergencies that should be top of mind to think about planning for would be civil unrest. We're all very aware of the political environment we found ourselves in 
and um, a number of our congregations have been the subjects of um, violence and threats. And so there are some things to consider for that. Also weather, what do we mean by weather? <clears throat> We've had such volatile weather patterns and weather is becoming more and more unpredictable. Um, in the last several years here, we've seen things like tornadoes, hundreds of miles um, that have never that have never left the ground and have uh, wreaked havoc on everything in their path. Of course, devastating hurricanes, lightning, um, floods, and um, a number of other um, weather situations that have made it very difficult um, and challenging if people don't have a plan in place. Um, fire, naturally, this is something that can um, be absolutely devastating and also very dangerous. So making sure there's a plan in place for that. Cybersecurity, this is becoming an ever increasing um, issue for many congregations and ministries across the country. Most unfortunately, we've seen a number of congregations end up in situations where they have they have received a fictitious request to wire um, a substantial amount of funds after just um, running an annual campaign, for example, and without you know picking up the phone and verifying and calling someone. We've had churches um, literally um, wire over a million dollars to a fictitious account um, that, that they didn't want to. So this is definitely something that is becoming um, more and more challenging for churches. And I would make sure that that's top of mind when you're considering planning. And then also vehicle ramming. A lot of people have never heard of this. What does this mean? Well, when you're thinking about uh, vehicle, people are utilizing vehicles as weapons and thinking about how can we mitigate risk um, to put barriers, if we're talking about a physical building, how can we put barriers in place to make something like this more difficult? Because naturally this can be extremely dangerous, but in the situation where people may be doing, uh, involved in parades or um, marches, vigils, things of that nature, thinking about um, planning for situations and having people in place to make sure that you're always observing the surroundings and you're mindful of the environment around you, even identifying specific people throughout the parade, throughout the march that can um, be paying attention to all of these things for to help keep everyone else safe, uh, maybe identifying a code word and a plan should someone be approaching your group that seems threatening or um, otherwise. So these are some things to keep top of mind. Obviously there are others, but primarily for this presentation, like I mentioned, we're going to mostly focus on active intruder as well as just in general emergency planning and, and, and what that means and some things that you need to think about throughout your planning. And then also I'll be providing resources, um, plenty of those that people will be able to tap into. Again, feel free to ask questions as we go along. So moving along, what does it mean to create an emergency plan? First and foremost, um, I think many times people can feel overwhelmed when it comes to thinking about all the things that there needs that we need to think about when it comes to creating a plan. And um, I, I've heard from a number of people that this is a really overwhelming process, but it doesn't have to be. First of all, let's remember Rome wasn't built in a day and um, anything just step by step. How do you eat an elephant bite by bite? Um, someone said that to me when I was young once and I've always remembered it because it made a lot of sense. So um, it can seem overwhelming, but little bits at a time, you can get through this and create something that can be really, really helpful. And just by starting with small steps. So after you start beginning your plan, it's setting up and organizing, you know, who's going to be part of this plan, who's going to help um, with this plan, and then identifying roles and resources 
that you will be utilizing um, within this plan. And I know the next step here is training. However, I would also like to say prior to that, communicating the plan, because every single um, stakeholder needs to know what the plan is in order to properly execute the plan. So it doesn't really make sense to have, say, an emergency active intruder plan in place or a fire, a fire plan in place in the event that your entire congregation doesn't know what it is. So communicating that plan, and then also training for that plan and making sure everyone understands what their role is, what they're supposed to do, where they are supposed to go, who they are supposed to call and communicate with, and then actually um, performing exercises or drills to see how well people were able to respond to the plan. After the exercise then, doing an evaluation and having, you know, getting back together and saying, okay, let's evaluate how we did. There might be some components of our plan that we were really successful on and we feel pretty good about, but there are others that we're not feeling that great about. So maybe we need to go back and revisit them and make sure that we all understand what our roles are. It also could be that um, maybe when you went to go execute the plan during an exercise, you realize that some of the ideas you had maybe didn't work. And so maybe you need to go back to the drawing board and have a conversation um, just to have, just to find, uh, figure out a better way to maybe execute this. And I saw a question pop up. I'm wondering um, if someone could read that. So, so we have, uh, will you provide the PowerPoint file for us uh, as yes. well as the link to YouTube? I absolutely, yes. This PowerPoint will be available as well as all of the links contained in it. Um, I intentionally put a lot of links here to make it easy and accessible for everyone. Um, so absolutely, this will be available. So yes, we'll make sure that everyone gets that when we send out the email. Okay. So next, thinking about who should be involved and what role should they play. We've talked about this. Church leadership. Um, developing an implementation of this plan, law enforcement, um, connecting with law enforcement, providing critical information on planning and prevention, um, emergency medical responders. Um, what information do we need to provide um, on your planning and response to them? Um, you'll note in this link that I have, and I'm going to open it so I can show you. Oh, good, it worked. So this is a resource by Insurance Board, Safety and Security Considerations for Ministries. Um, all of uh, this resource has individual links within it that you will be able to access um, with really critical information and links that will help um, churches and ministries while they're thro throughout their planning. There's a disaster preparedness plan that you will notice, and then additional plans with FEMA, Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security and CISA, um, as well as additional resources by insurance Sport. So hopefully you will find that helpful. And um, that is something that I would highly recommend that um, churches and ministries take a look at as they're going through and developing their emergency plan. The uh, next slide. So what we'd like to do is go into, I would mentioned we're gonna talk a little bit about active intruders uh, um, a little more in, in depth. So because you know we had talked about all of the um, threats and the threats of violence and um, active intruder situations that houses of worship has, have faced over the last couple of years, they're absolutely on the rise. If you take a look at and these slides were provided to me, by the way, by the Department of Homeland Security and CISA. This is their data and research um, here. So um, be between just 2017 and 2021, there's been a 52.5% increase. Um, that doesn't include anything that we've seen ourselves within the last couple of years since 2021. Um, most unfortunately, I know that Insurance Board um, has had a church within the last year 
that did experience an active intruder situation with fatalities, um, which was devastating for their community and uh, naturally. And so wanted to give a little bit of information about um, and, and provide some resources um, and some thought provoking um, considerations as you're moving forward to keep in mind as you're developing um, your plan. So the next slide, what are some of the active intruder stats over the last 20 years between 2000 and 2020? You know, we see here, there have been 345 um, shooters. Now that's only up till 2020. Their gender predominantly at the time um, were male incidents, 333 incidents. And um, moving along to this, which is something that I definitely wanted to point out in, in talking about the total number of active shooter incidents and locations, um, you'll note here that, and this is over 20 years, that 15 of them, and this is as of 2020, we all know for certain that that number has increased. However, I don't know the actual number as of now in 2023. I know for certain that I could add at least four or five that I am aware of over the last couple of years that have just been in the news or have actually been, um, you know, within uh, within um, our communities that most of us are aware of. And there's many that maybe didn't even make the news, so or the national news. And so this is something houses of worship are definitely targets, specifically um, LGBTQ communities. Um, we've noted over the last couple of months that um, those churches and ministries that were hosting drag events were receiving multiple threats of violence. I know, um, so I'm located in Cleveland, Ohio, and I know that we had a local church that um, had, actually had a Molotov cocktail tail thrown at it because they were going to be hosting a drag event and multiple other inquiries from churches across the country who have expressed deep concern over um, various threats of violence that they've received. Church in Texas, um, LGBTQ have a uh, church in Texas that was um, hosting outdoor worship, had a number of pickup trucks come in with people wielding um, rifles in the back bed and um, surrounding them. So there have been a number of stories that I'm sure many of you are aware and could share some of your own. And so this is why it's important for us to plan and make sure that we're aware of our surroundings and think about what we need to do should a situation like this occur. So moving forward, these are slides, this is direct information from the Department of Homeland Security and CISA. Um, their recommendations is pretty simple when anyone is in a situation such as this. Run, hide, fight. So in an active shooter situation, you should quickly determine the most reasonable way to protect your own life, okay? Um, it's important for staff and congregants to be trained so that they know how to react quickly if they're ever encountered with a situation such as this. We're going to briefly go through um, some of these. So run and escape if at all possible. That's the first option. If you can get away, absolutely get away. If there's a, an escape path, attempt to evacuate immediately. Getting as far away from the shooter is um, should be everyone's top priority. Make sure to leave belongings behind. Don't care about that. Make sure that you are just doing what you can to, to get to safety and helping others um, escape as well. Um, making sure to warn and prevent individuals from entering an area where an active shooter might be. So again, go back to that planning. Think about, gosh, if someone were to come into our building, what are we going to do to make sure that we're alerting other people that might be in other places in our building. How do we let each other know? Do we have a PA system? Um, if not, can everyone um, be in any sort of a group chat app that people could communicate with 
during emergencies, for example. Okay, the next step is hiding. If an escape route is not possible for you, the best bet is to get out of the shooter's view and stay as quiet as you can. Silencing electronic devices and making sure they don't vibrate, lock and block doors, close blinds, turn off lights, be as quiet as possible. Do not use your body as a blockade and try not to trap yourself. Also not hiding in giant groups um, so that you can spread out and try to hide um, separately, if at all possible. If there's a way to silently communicate with police or people on the outside using text messages or social media, putting signs in windows, think about those things and making sure to stay in place until law enforcement can give everyone the clear. Um, your, sh your hiding place should be out of the shooter's view and provide protection from shots at you. Now, I will say that also, CISA and Department of Homeland Security, uh, great tip is that steel metal cabinets um, will withstand most bullets. And so that's something to think about if people are in offices and have access to those, um, if you're in an office and you have an opportunity to blockade doors with things such as this, that would be extremely helpful. And also then be thinking about how you can prepare to fight should you get put in a situation where now there is no other option and I'm now put in a situation where I need to fight. I did see a question pop up and I wanna make sure that I answer it. Yes, it says, what is the responsibility to others in the community? Is it to each their own? So ideally that is, um, I would say that it's human nature, the responsibility to others in the community is it's human nature to try to help people wherever possible. If certain people are not able to um, move as quickly or get out, um, is there someone that can help them and get them out quicker than they would? And is that person um, willing to do that? That's an individual choice of um, the people that are experiencing this situation. And everyone is certainly different. I know myself, I would be that person that would be thinking about the people on the right and the left of me and how do I make sure that I help as many people as I can get out as safely as possible um, in a situation such as that. If we're talking about um, leadership, I think I think what we would say is that our uh, the best bet for making sure that people get out safely is having a plan because no one's going to know what to do and how to react quickly if no one's ever talked about it, thought about it, or um, talked about what, what they should do and, and how they should communicate and where to go in any of these situations, be it a fire, um, a weather situation, um, civil unrest, if there's a riot. Um, so the obligation, first and foremost, I would say would be to make sure that you're thinking about these things, that they're top of mind, that everyone's talking about them, and taking some things under consideration of what they're going to do. I had an elderly community share with us that they actually, I mean, they went to great lengths because they were very concerned about they can't move quickly is what they said. And they said that they actually um, figured out ways to put um, uh, weapons, so to speak, and, and, and I don't mean weapons like guns, um, but things that could be utilized to help them if they were in a situation that were in um, fake books and things like that, that are in the pews that only they know about. And they had gone through great, they went through great lengths to make sure that they know who's going to help whom, who might be in a wheelchair or who walks very slowly and who can and pick up whom. So those are some of the, depending on who's in your congregation and, and what you're dealing with, those are some of the, the situations that you can talk about in advance. I hope I answered that question um, for you as best as I could. Fight. This is something that you would be doing as an absolute last resort. Um, obviously the best bet is to get away. 
and then to hide. But if you are put in a situation where your life is in danger, the idea is to be able to incapacitate the shooter in some way so that um, you are able to protect yourself and protect others. I saw another question pop up. It's just uh, an acknowledgement that you did answer the question. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. So um, commit to your actions. And, at, you know, if you're going to do this, you need to mean it. Act as aggressively as possible. Be thinking about things like if, if you're if you're hiding, look around you and think, okay, what is it that I could actually use as a weapon to protect myself? If there's a group of you, how can you work together to ambush the shooter um, with, you know, is there a chair, a fire extinguisher, scissors, books, et cetera, and be prepared and understand that the idea is to incapacitate this individual, throw things at them, improvise weapons. I mean, like it's, it's harder, the more that chaos that you create to be able to um, throw this person off and making a lot of noise. It is something that would be able to serve you well, other than just sitting there and cowering in a corner. That's your better, that's a better way to enter a situation and hopefully come out of it. Um, I have several videos um, of people that share information about that actually withstood a an active shooter situation that I'm not showing this evening, but they talk about, you know, in that split second, how they made the determination to. Um, reach out and throw something or grab someone's gun and or or trip them to incapacitate them so that other people could um, assist and they were able to get the gun away from someone and um, as a, consequentially everyone survived. So um, and then next, communicating whenever is possible. These are directly from the Department of Homeland Security. Whenever and however possible, you want to be able to give as much information as you can to anyone and everyone about the shooter. How many shooters are there? Where's the location of that shooter? Give a physical description of what that individual looks like. Um, the number of known potential victims. And understand that law enforcement's first task is to end the incident. So they may have to pass injured individuals along the way to make sure that that happens. Also understand, and I know is on a prior slide, if you're running out, making sure your hands aren't in your pockets. There's a lot of chaos in these situations and professional security advisors have said, you know, you need to keep in mind that law enforcement isn't sure who the shooter is, who the person is with bad intent when they're coming into some you know, mass situation where people are running, people are screaming, there's shots being fired. And so having your hands up and making sure that people know that this is not you, you are not running at them, you don't have a weapon on you, and you are just seeking to escape. Okay. Is that an extra question or are we good to move forward? We are good to move forward. Okay. So, um, Planning for an active intruder. This is more resources on how you develop a plan. So Insurance Board has developed a partnership with CISA and the Department of Homeland Security. The um, chief of the active assailant division actually wrote uh, a great um, article for us at Insurance Board for secure, regarding security plans for houses of worship and how to start. And, you know, ideally establishing roles and responsibilities. We've talked about this. Conducting a vulnerability assessment. Now, one of the great things that I would like to tell you about, like, how do we do this? Well, there is, um, CISA has developed an actual security self-assessment tool that I'm actually gonna take the time here to click on just to show you. Um, that this is a paper-based one, but it talks about how you can go through faith-based community self-assessment um, and you can take the survey, okay? And then you can also, this is a guide. So depending on how you answer the various questions in the survey, 
you can go through and take a look at, okay, so this is an example. Does the house of worship have a security manager, a security committee to make security management decisions? So this is identifying, um, you know, whether or not this very low. So that means this is, this is something they may want to work on. They don't have a security manager or a committee. Um, and so this might be an area that they want to work on. And they actually give specific individual um, recommendations depending on where you answer in this continuum. Okay, so, and these are the options for consideration that I'm talking about underneath. So if you don't have that, they're telling you, gee, this is something that, you know, making recommendations on what you can do. This is great stuff. And it is specifically, they have so many tools and resources specifically developed for houses of worship. And why is it, you ask maybe, why are they, why do they have all this, all these resources for houses of worship? No one has actually come out and told me this um, specifically, but if we think about it, which is why I'm so passionate about it, we know that churches are the hub of their communities, right? Anytime that there's an emergency situation, no matter what it is, if it's weather, if it's pandemic, um, if there is, um, if people need food, if they need housing, if they need shelter, churches are on the ready to make sure that they're receiving and they want to be helpful in their communities. And so we need churches. We want to ensure the sustainability of churches because they're the hub of our communities across the country. And so that is why I believe they have, made, and they also know they're targeted um, by a number of different groups um, and have received lots of threats of violence. And, and, we, and this is their way of being able to provide resources to assist. I did see another question, I think maybe pop up. Please so, go ahead. Yeah, I answered it. It's, we, because of the way we're sharing the screen, we we weren't able to see when you were on the website. So I just- I'm so it, sorry. Oh, okay. no, it's okay. I won't so, do that again. So yeah, I just <laughs> informed that they will receive all the links. Yes. Uh, in the PowerPoint. Yes. Okay, I won't do that again. Thank you for letting me know. Sorry, everyone. Um, But I promise you, there are so many links and so many resources, you will not be disappointed. And, and um, they have this, they'll be sending it out. And feel in my number, um, my email and my phone number is on this. So anyone is um, more than, I'm more than happy to connect with anyone after the presentation and share anything that I know. Okay, moving forward. Planning for an active intruder. What should be in, a, in the plan? This is a number of links for mitigating attacks on houses of worship. Again, some of these links are redundant from um, past slides, but most of them are actually just additional resources. Um, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but there's a lot there. And um, I think we were just talking before um, everyone had jumped on, just to say that there are so many resources there's um, out there, but um, everything's coming at us so fast. There's so much information that we don't even know where to go first. So hopefully this is giving you something, uh, some tools for where to start. And okay, so next, um, the Department of Homeland Security, actually, uh, you know, they have an online resource, uh, what you can do. This is um, through FEMA and it's a self-paced course that takes approximately 45 minutes to complete. Um, and upon completion, participants can take a short online final exam that is scored, um, that gives uh, a certificate to participants who finish the course and are able to pass the final exam. Um, they also offer multiple webinars, countless webinars um, available for active shooter, as well as vehicle ramming, as well as de-escalation, and a number of other fantastic resources that are available um, to houses of worship that I would strongly encourage. They also have um, activities and exercises that um, 
congregations can utilize if they're getting together and trying to perform an exercise, a practice exercise to see how well prepared they are. <clears throat> planning, I'm also thinking about planning with law enforcement. Um, this is um, really important because if, now I, I know I've heard from various congregations that have said, okay, law enforcement in our community has not been especially helpful. I understand that in some communities that may uh, be the case. However, they, it, you don't just have to rely on local police. There are sheriffs, there is the FBI, there is protective security advisors, there is the Department of Homeland Security, and I'm going to give you some resources that I would highly recommend that you reach out to regardless of your relationship with local law enforcement, um, because I, it would be a good thing for any congregation to know who their professional security advisor is through the Department of Homeland Security as because they have a number of resources within various regions that they offer ongoing um, webcasts. Um, and will also, if you are on their list and they're aware of you, if there's a threat within the region or an area, that is something that you will receive notification on, okay? So, but moving on with law enforcement, asking them to perform a vulnerability assessment if they're able to, you know, sharing floor plans, schematics, information about locks, how to access the building. This is where we have security cameras. These are where the alarms are. Um, and, 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 for, and pr providing information on any prior threats that, um, to the church or its members. That's critical to make sure that um, all of this information is shared with law enforcement. <clears throat> the other thing that I would oh, okay, uh, like to mention is that um, John Edgerton from the UCC gave me permission to tell people that any anyone, regardless of what denomination that they are in, does not matter. If there is a congregation that is actively in the thick of dealing with a very difficult, violent, you know, serious threats of violence and difficult situations that John actually has um, developed a relationship with an individual through the FBI and has learned how to kind of help um, ministries that are in the thick of it help navigate that situation and, and get the help that they need. Um, so I, um, and he said he was more than uh, willing to assist anyone. And so that is something that um, perhaps the Open and Affirming Coalition are aware of him and might be willing to share that information if someone were to reach out to the Open and Affirming Coalition, um, because he said he's more than happy to help anyone. Um, so that is critical as well. Uh, why, this is just saying why it is cr critical. This is why it matters. Um, this is what 25 years of mass shooting studies has shown us. More than 60% of uh, situations actually ended before the police arrived. So the average length uh, time or length of an attack is five to six minutes or less. Unfortunately, in a lot of situations, it takes police at least five or six minutes or more to respond. So it's a very unpredictable situation that evolves very quickly. And that's why it's so critical for us to have a plan in place to and to practice that plan so that we know what we're going to do if we're faced with a situation. But this same thing could be said really for any of the other risks that we mentioned in a fire, in a, in a tornado, in a hurricane. Um, there's a number of situations where in a vehicle ramming situation, if you don't know what you're going to do when you're faced with it and it hasn't been discussed, you are going to pause. People are going to have different ideas. It's going to be a little bit more chaotic than it would be 
if there's a plan actually in place that can be executed. It, did, a, did a question pop up? Nope, I'm just gonna say we're at about a nine minute mark. Got it. I want to let you know. Okay, thank you. So we've all heard an ounce of prevention is a pet was worth a pound of cure. Um, so identifying, assessing, and managing risk will really help protect your ministry. This is a resource that I wanted to mention that is critical that I would, I would advise everyone to take a look at. Because as you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, there's no way that I could we could ever do this. Our congregation is small. Please um, pay attention to the power of hello resource. I, um, I just heard from John Edgerton about a uh, church that he shared with me on the West Coast that um, was receiving threats of violence from the Proud Boys. Um, they have a, a, a significant LGBTQ community. And they had said they were going to show up, and they said when they were when they were going to show up. And this individual said they were going to harm them. The individual showed up, and um, they were met and greeted with um, from the pastor's father, who uh, I guess the description was someone who was uh, kind of looked like a farmer and um, just a salt of the earth kind of person, who was pleasant. Hi, how are you? Is there something I can do for you? Well, why don't you sit down? Um, let's talk about this. And they actually had a, a peaceful conversation. They talked and the person from the Proud Boys left the Congress, didn't just leave peacefully, but left a, a nice note that stated, thank you so much for being welcoming to me. And I'm not going to do anything here. So. This piece just talks about um, how, and I apologize if you're hearing my dog bark. This piece talks about how um, uh, you know how you're interrupting somebody that might actually have bad intentions just simply by space putting greeters there to say hi, how are you this morning? Is there anything that I can do for you? So nice to meet you. My name's Lisa. Um, where are you coming from? We're so glad you're here. Hey, let me introduce you to so-and-so. The other thing about doing that, it allows you to observe behaviors and situations to determine whether or not this person could be a threat. And then um, the only thing you might need to do is have a plan in advance of if you identify someone that could be a threat, how are you communicating that to everyone else? Is there a code word? Um, is there going to be a text app that everyone in the congregation um, is on and would receive, and they would know what to do next. So this is a resource I highly recommend. Um, next, these are some various resources through FEMA, um, and they have all kinds of additional resources that are there to assist you. The other thing I would mention is that CISA and Department of Homeland Security has protective security advisors. Every region of our country has a number of, pro of protective security advisors assigned to it, depending on where you live. You can find out who that individual is by simply emailing on the bottom here, I have it listed, central at cisa.gov. You can say, hi, I'm Church ABC, and I'm reaching out because um, I'm located here. This is my address. I would like to um, connect with my professional, with, with the professional security advisor in my region. They will respond to you. They're supposed to respond to you within 24 hours to let you know who that individual is and provide that contact information. Once they do that, you can reach out and have a conversation and invite this person to come to your congregation um, or at least get minimally get signed up so that you are able to um, be alerted of any particular threats that might be in the environment or any um, webcasts or resources that they have to share with you. This is the mission areas and what the PSAs, what the PSAs are supposed to do and what they can help with. So don't feel bad about reaching out and asking someone to come out. Understand they're very busy. 
They have only, you know, there's only a few of them within a region. However, um, I have talked, spoken directly with them and they said specifically that they are able to come out and perform a, a, a survey and threat assessment, even a written one, that if someone was to hire a security firm, they've, they've told me would be anywhere between five and $20,000 to do. So they can help identify areas where a congregation may need to shore up in some of their security resources. Um, this is just a slide talking about CISA assist visits and um, what they're able to do. I'm gonna move through these quickly. And also CISA does offer support for exercises. Now I will tell you this, they all tell me they can't, they will not come in and write someone's plan for that. That's why they're providing the resources because every church, every individual facility is unique. They are not able to do it for you. But if you have a plan and you've practiced your plan and you've, you, you feel that you really are ready to conduct an exercise, they will stage an exercise where they will come out and help you do this so that you're able to see and evaluate your plan. And they'll also provide feedback. Now I wanted to mention um, some opportunities that are available to all of our congregations across the country through um, Department of Homeland Security and um, CISA. I'm going to go through this quickly, but understand the resources are here. I want to make sure everyone knows that there is a nonprofit security grant program that is available to churches across the country. Um, they specifically were developed to help prevent the any acts of terrorism. <clears throat> so we know, I, I don't need to go into great detail about what any acts of terrorism are. However, they actually define what that is and what they think, um, what, what they qualify as being an act of terrorism. Eligible organizations are 501c3 nonprofits which are churches um, and organizations that are tax exempt. Okay, so 501c3s <clears throat> or 501as um, that are tax exempt are eligible to receive these funds. In the fiscal year of 2023, $305 million was set aside um, for nonprofit security grants to fund. Um, nonprofits in houses of worship to be able to shore up their security. There are two different parts of this. One specifically is for urban areas. They have 152 million allocated for, and the other is just referred to as their state program. The maximum amount for any um, one site is $150,000. If there are multiple sites under a, in the organization, the organization may apply for up to $450,000 to, to, for, and, and we'll, we'll speak in a minute here about what you can apply for. We already talked about the two funding streams, right? we, um, the urban funding stream, as well as um, which they, there's a list of what's considered a high risk urban area. I've provided links here. If you're located there, that would be something that you would apply to. I would also like to mention that churches need to go through their state administrative agency. So these grants are applied through the specific state administrative agency. How do you find out who that is? Where is the nonprofit preparedness grant manual? It's right here. Um, as a new program, you can find out information there. What are they basing it on? Based on vulnerability assessments. Also remember that I specifically mentioned 
you can reach out, you can get a vulnerability assessment done by a professional security advisor, providing historical perspective, identify prior threats that have occurred. And the symbolic value of a site as a highly recognized as potential targets of terrorism. We all know that most unfortunately and tragically, the LGBTQ community is a highly recognized um, as being a potential target of terrorism. So this is something that, and if there have been past instances, that's something that you're able to share within the grant that might make you, uh, put you above others when they're looking at considerations. Um, this provides a link to, you know, well, I don't know where my state administrative agency is. There's a link here to show you where that is. This link will take you with a list of specific states and it will tell you who your agency is and who the specific individual is, what their phone number is, as well as their email. If I were applying for this and I'm someone I've applied for many grants over the years and gotten millions of dollars worth of grants in both privately, um, federally and state funded grants. I would say that if, um, I would continue to reach out to this person until you have the opportunity to connect with them and make sure that you're aware of when the application deadline is, which is different in every state. And if for some reason, if you look it up and it's not available now, it might be available, you know, you know this for next year and you can start talking about it. This just talks about the vulnerability assessment and what they're looking for. I will leave that to you. And also they're focused on security related activities. Note that funding can be used for contracted security personnel, security related planning, training, and the acquisition and installation of security equipment. And this includes improvements on property, including buildings owned or leased by the nonprofit organization at the time of application. So this qualifies and heads up any new, this is bonus points are given. So if you have never applied for this grant in the past, you get 15 points just for trying for the first time when they're scoring your grant. If you're in, if you are in a population where you can prove and demonstrate that you are serving an underserved community, you get another 15 points scored towards your grant. And FEMA will add an additional 10 points if they can demonstrate that, that um, where you're located has a high SVI ranking, okay? Um, this is just providing additional resources from Department of Homeland Security and some additional information about this grant. And insurance board um, for those denominations that we insure, uh, the six denominations that we insure, I just wanted to mention that we do have a risk champion program where we are trying to connect with middle governing bodies so that we can help create a culture of safety across the country and disseminate critical pieces of information to all of our congregations. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm sorry that it had to go so quickly. I know there was a lot of information, but I hope you will find it useful. And um, please do not hesitate to reach out. My um, email, is located at the end of this PowerPoint presentation. And I would be happy to answer questions or provide any additional information. You're on mute. So I did want to say that we did go over a little bit, which for this information, it was just very important. And so thank you all so much for hanging in there. The whole thing will be available um, and I did have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, so one is answer, I'll answer Annika. Uh, yes, you will be receiving the PowerPoint through the email. You're going to get it tomorrow with a link of this uh, 
entire video. Someone else asked that they've applied for a vulnerability grant in Arizona. Any idea how long it takes to get it done? Vulnerability assessment, rather, in Arizona. Oh, um, and so I actually had met the um, prior PSA in Arizona, but um, she had since retired. Um, it depends on how busy they are and the organization and, and what they're up to and if they have the availability. I've heard some people have something done relatively quickly and while others have to wait longer and each region is different. So unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't have more information on, on a standard time frame. One more question. Mm -hmm. At some point, can you point us towards guidance about congregants and firearms to mitigate these situations and to better understand the risk? Are you referring to firearms, congregants utilizing firearms to protect themselves within the congregation? I'm trying to make sure that I understand that. It says yes. Okay. So um, personally, um, that is up to each individual um, congregation to make that determination whether they're going to allow that. I would say, however, that um, we have been advised um, by law enforcement, it is not something that um, uh, we would recommend having firearms within the congregate, having congregants armed. Um, why is that? Well, um, there is more risk associated with the, um, for the individual organization. It would be better to actually hire a security, if, if security is required, um, actually hiring a security company to manage that situation. Unless that individual um, regularly practices, I know people have referenced something that has happened in Texas where someone was armed and they had a secure, I don't know if people are aware of that. A couple of years ago, someone was armed and someone came in with a gun, went to point a gun and the security team, this individual, um, immediately responded and shot the, the um, intruder. That doesn't always happen so easily because that individual actually owned a shooting range and had been significantly trained and practices every single day. So if you think about it, unless that individual is in a situation where they are practicing and this is something that they do on the regular, um, I would caution churches um, to go that direction because there's a lot of chaos that ensues in a situation like that. And it very well could be that someone could accidentally shoot um, an innocent person or congregant um, who is there. Thank you. You're welcome. Want, want to thank Lisa Gonzalez for this uh, informative session. I want to bring on the executive director of the Open and Affirming Coalition, Dr. Katrina Roseboro Marsh, just for um, her greetings. Yes, Lisa, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation to, to, as you said, the obligation is to talk about it. And to this is the opportunity to start talking about it and to bring just a general uh, overview of just a piece of what this encompasses. So we thank you for your yes. We thank you that we'll have you back. And we'll, we, we've Any talked time. about doing some, some actually series on each of these things with you and some other professional security advisors. So thank you so much for planting this seed and watering it for others and continuing this journey with us. Happy to do it. I wish you all well. And I thank you very much for having me here. Awesome. Thank you all so much. We have uh, two more webinars this month. Next week is Sexual Wellness with Dr. Carlton. Um, the registration link goes live on our social media in about 25 minutes, so you can start signing up for that. And then on the 22nd, we have Beyond Binaries, where we talk uh, to people of different uh, identities, gender expressions. Uh, it's a panel discussion on the 22nd. Both are at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you all so much for uh, spending this Thursday evening with us. Hope that you got lots out of it and you will receive a link um, for the video and uh, the PowerPoint presentation with all those links in it tomorrow if you're registered. 
for this session. Anything else? Awesome. Everyone have uh, a great evening and thank you so much for coming. Take care and God bless. Thanks everyone. God bless. Bye-bye.